I am in no way encouraging anyone to attempt the anodizing process. I am not making this video as a guide to DIY anodizing. I am showing how I went about anodizing a small aluminum part with an overview of the general steps of the process for informational purposes only. I want to make that clear that this is not a tutorial. Do not try this at home. This process involves dangerous chemicals, some at high temperatures, which poses serious health risk. During this whole process, I wore appropriate PPE to protect my eyes and cover all exposed skin. Uh, just a heads up, this will be a pretty technical video. Lots of me talking over pictures of my experimental setup and whatnot. Not a lot of interesting stuff to take videos of. Things hanging in a beaker, then being rinsed and dipped in another beaker. This is my practice work piece that is the same material and similar size and shape to the part I actually want to anodize. This part is 6061 T6 aluminum that I put different surface finishes on to see how that affected anodizing and to get an idea of how I want to prepare my part later. On one side, I bead blasted the surface with fairly coarse media and then used a fine file on a section of that same side. On the other side, I did rough machining, then sanded and polished half of it, and then did some finer machining on the other edge. I will discuss these surface finishes in more detail later with accompanying, accompanying SEM images. So the part needs to be hung on titanium or aluminum wire. Uh, I chose titanium wires. It seems to be more reliable in maintaining electrical contacts. It does not oxidize like aluminum wire, which uh, if the surface anodizes the aluminum wire, it would not be as conductive. Uh, so I folded the wire and made sure it had some spring to it for expanding in the center hole of the part. The rest of the wire was bent in a way so that it would hang over the beaker edges and allow electrical contact and also allow me to easily grab it and move it from bath to bath without touching the workpiece. I purchased all my chemicals and equipment from Caswell and Amazon. For the following processes, I am using hot plates with magnetic stir function that can be purchased on Amazon for around $60. So the first step in this is degreasing the part. Uh, any oils from my hand could ruin the anodizing and surface finish. Uh, so first I solvent washed it with acetone, then isopropanol, and then let it dry. And then I used this Alkanox cleaner as that's what I had laying around the lab at work. Uh, it's a powder and I mixed 10 grams per liter of deionized de water. Uh, this was set on a hot plate and allowed to reach 40 C. Then I soaked the part in it for five minutes without agitation. Then I rinsed the DI water and checked water break free to confirm that there were no oils left on the surface and I was all good to go. So of course, moving forward, all these soak times, temperatures, and concentrations I am using are spe specific to the particular chemicals that I purchased. Uh, I will also link to a Caswell low current density anodizing guide I referenced for informational purposes only. After I confirmed water break free with the DI water and the part was thoroughly rinsed, I needed to deoxidize it. All oxidation needs to be stripped off of the part for the anodizing process to create a new and completely uniform oxidization layer. I used a Caswell chemical for this in a solution of 125 milliliters of chemical per liter of DI water at 45 degrees C without agitation. The part was soaked for three minutes then rinsed with DI water. The electrolyte needed for anodizing aluminum is sulfuric acid or common car battery acid available at most auto parts stores. Uh, the needed concentration is 10 to 15% by weight. Uh, this is the electrolyte used for type 2 and 3 anodizing with the difference between them being the temperature of the solution and the current delivered to the parts. Type 2 anodizing is referred to as decorative. Type 3 anodizing is uh, referred to as hard anodizing. So the battery I got had a specific gravity of 1.265. You can see it circled in black on the container there. I looked up this value in a chart that relates the specific gravity of the solution to the percent sulfuric acid by weight. I have circled the values in red and you can see that sp this specific gravity corresponds to about 35% sulfuric acid solution by weight. So to get to the needed 10 to 15% by weight, I diluted the solution three to one in DI water. Then I checked to see, then I checked the pH to see if I was in the right range. It is important to always add acid to water and not the water to the acid. Adding a little bit of water to a larger volume of acid can result in a rapid exothermic reaction that may boil the acid. Boiling acid is not good. You don't want to deal with that. I didn't want to deal with that. Adding a little acid at a time to a larger volume of water is much safer and will generate less heat. 
Uh, I have access to very expensive power supplies at my work, but I decided to use this $50 Amazon DC power supply to see if it would work. The current requirements are based on the surface area of the part and for this low current density anodizing uh, process, Caswell specifies 30 milliamps per square inch. I calculated the surface area of the practice part and then set the power supply to 160 milliamps and let the voltage fluctuate with the impedance of the anodizing bath. It ended up being about 10 volts. I was expecting somewhere around 10 to 12 based on what I had read, so this was fine. By the end of the process, the voltage had stabilized to around 8.8 .8 volts. For the cathode, I purchased a uh, general purpose cathode plate from Caswell. It's just pure lead. Uh, from my research, it seems 6063 T6 aluminum is the best, but this will work fine for my purposes, and it was cheap. Information was varied about the anode to cathode surface area ratio, but generally the area of the anode is two to 10 times greater than the area of the cathode. This means I really only need somewhere between 2.5 and 0.5 square inches of cathode surface area. So I just cut some small strips of lead and put them on either side of my part in the beaker and connected them in parallel. With the current set, I let the anodizing run for 90 minutes specified in the Caswell guide. The sulfuric acid solution was at room temperature and I used a magnetic stir bar to agitate it. The agitation is needed to circulate the electrolyte, but also knock off the bubbles that form on the surface of the anode and cathode that would impede the reaction. The positive connection is attached to the anode workpiece and the negative is connected to the cathode plates. I attach my cathode plates in parallel with a jumper. This is opposite of electroplating where the workpiece is generally the cathode. After anodizing was completed, I rinsed the part in DI water and then soaked it in a bath of baking soda and DI water for a couple of minutes. I used 28 grams of baking soda per liter of DI water. Uh, this is to neutralize any of the remaining sulfuric acid before dyeing the part as that could cause streaks and ruin the color. After the baking soda bath, I rinsed with DI water again. At this point, I dried the part off with CDA and took it to the scanning electron microscope to try to capture what the aluminum oxide structure looked like. Looked like. So if my color got screwed up, it was because I handled it before dyeing it, even though I was wearing gloves or because there was a gap in time between anodizing and um, dyeing it. I bought black anodizing dye from Caswell per, and per the instructions of the chemical, I mixed 16 grams per liter of dye in DI water and heated it to 60 C. I let the part soak in it for 15 minutes with a magnetic stir bar going. I pulled the part out and rinsed it with DI water. Obviously the part did not turn out very dark at all and I will go into detail as why I believe this happened a little later. After the part is dyed, it needs to be sealed. The dye has soaked into the pores of the aluminum oxide, and now those pores need to be sealed up to keep the dye in. For this, I used liquid nickel acetate, which I purchased from Amazon. Per the instructions, I mixed up a solution with 10.5 milliliters per liter of DI water. I let the part soak in the bath at 70 to 80 C for 15 minutes with slight agitation to keep temperature uniform. Then I pulled it out and rinsed it with DI water and dried it off. The part needs to sit in ambient conditions for 24 to 48 hours for the sealant to fully protect against dye leach out. Uh, the part seemed to get a little bit darker with the sealing process. So this part is clearly not black. Um, cool color, but not what I was going for. Uh, dye soak time affects color and anodizing for longer should create a deeper grain structure or thicker oxide layer that would make the color darker as it could pull in more dye. I think my main issue is that I took the part out of the anodizing bath and I didn't dye it immediately so I could try my scanning electron microscope imaging. Uh, this allowed the pores to close and that minimized the amount of dye that it was able to soak up. Uh, the dye clearly states in the instructions to dye it immediately after anodizing. I also went with the recommended concentration of dye and DI water, but of course that could be increased for a darker color or a quicker dyeing process probably. The sealing process made the part slightly darker, I think. Another issue that came up was the uh, current dropped off at one point and I could not get the voltage high enough to push the current I need through the solution. I pulled the part from the bath and found my titanium wire had come loose and lost a good connection to the workpiece. I rebent the wire for a better connection, was able to reestablish my needed current level and continue the process. Uh, this happened twice and while it was a pain, it was pretty easy to fix. Um, 
So the surface finishes pretty much look the same as when I started, but just in a slightly different color now. Uh, the mirror finish did get dulled quite a bit by the anodizing, and in the final product, the fine file finish looked about as bright as the polished finish. Uh, the rougher the finish, the darker the color looks, and the rough bead blasted area looks the darkest. So I actually went ahead and anodized the part I needed to anodize, and I made sure to dye it right after anodizing. Um, I also anodized it for 30 minutes longer. It came out slightly darker, but by no means was it black. Uh, I think the fundamental problem is that my anodizing layer is not thick enough, which means that the pores aren't deep enough to take in enough dye to turn the part black. I think if I dyed some other color than black, this would have turned out better. Uh, unfortunately, there's not a nice deep black anodized part I can show you, but that's how things like this go. I'll do some research and try again. I got plenty of chemistry left over. Uh, if I have success, I'll drop a comment down below this video with that information and any updates that I have. Uh, so there were some good learnings during this process, mainly that it is relatively straightforward and not too difficult. My process seemed fine in terms of mixing chemistry, agitation, and heating. Uh, if I found that, I found that if I was careful, it was easy to keep the part clean to prevent surface finish issues. While my color did not come out right, it was certainly uniform, so that's good. Uh, I need to be a little bit more careful when I hang my parts on titanium wire to make sure I have a good electrical connection that will continue to be a good electrical connection throughout the long process. And while this result is not what I was hoping for in terms of color, I did what I set out to do, and that was anodize a small aluminum part. So I'm going to call this a win. Now, if anyone who has experience with anodizing wants to share any tips or tricks or has any other ideas why I was not able to get a darker black color, please do share in the comment section below. This is the scanning electron microscope that I have access to in the shared tooling space at my work. It is a little desktop unit that is quite capable for its size and price. I wanted to see the effects of surface finish on the final anodized part and also wanted to see if I could capture an image of the porous columnar grain structure of the aluminum oxide that I had formed. I prepped my part in the ways shown and imaged all the different surface finishes at the same magnification level for a comparison before I began the anodizing process. This is the bead blasted surface at 250 times magnification in the top left, 500 times on the top right, and 1000 times magnification on the bottom. I was pretty surprised with the roughness and topography of it once I zoomed in. It is even more striking when compared to some of the other surface finishes. This is the rough machine surface at a thousand times magnification. I cut fast with a pretty dull four flute three eighths inch end mill. This is nicer quality machining that was done at a lower travel speed with a sharp quarter inch diameter two flute end mill. You can see that the horizontal lines are much finer and closer together than the roughly machined part. I ran a fine single cut file over the bead blasted surface until the surface was uniform. Uh, the lines are in the direction of my file strokes. The finish looked like the finely machined surface finish uh, macroscopically and at a thousand times magnification the lines and spacing are similar as well. This is the surface that I polished at a thousand times magnification. After the fine machining, I sanded from 400 to 2000 grit, then polished it with a buffing wheel and polishing compound. There are still some machining marks left in the middle of the polished area, but this was an image in an area that looked close to a mirror finish. It is interesting to me that sanding lines are still uh, visible. I'm guessing the small brighter specks are small chunks of aluminum or polishing compound that have become embedded in the surface. Prior to imaging this, all I did was rinse the part with isopropanol and wipe it off with a soft cotton cloth. So unfortunately, the SEM that I have access to does not have the resolution to image the aluminum oxide grain structure. So these are all the images I got, but I still think they provide an interesting look at some of the different surface finishes. Uh, the surfaces post anodizing did not look appreciably different at a thousand times magnification than when I started, so I didn't include any of those images. Uh, so anyways, that's all I got. Uh, thanks for watching, and I hope this was interesting and informative.